picked up my notes even though they didn't have my name on them. Sunday morning.
never fails. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. How long has it been since you danced in your living room? Or in your car or wherever you're here in this wherever you're with us today I don't know how how long's it been how long has it been well wherever you're at and whatever you're doing why don't you pick up your feet and dance with us this morning this ought to be good
yeah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, I want you to know, you people that are watching with us, we are one together. If you have any messages, things for us to pray about, just put it right there on the broadcast, and we promise you we will read it. I'm going to receive our offering right now. And how we do this is you can either go to the Donate button if you're watching on our website, or if you're watching on Facebook, you can go to our website and donate there, or you can donate by PayPal. It is paypal.me front slash glory bound ministries that's paypal.me front slash glory bound ministries i'm telling you we have such a wonderful group of people that join together that financially we are doing wonderfully as a church i notice that a lot of people think churches are just there for the money just there for the money are you kidding god's our provider and you people me us all of us together we're doing a wonderful job for God gave us seed to sow, so sow that seed. And if you want to just come by the church and put it in the mail slot, very soon we're going to be together again. I believe that. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless the seed that's being sown. I bless every person that's watching in the holy name of Jesus. Love you, Father. Love you, people. Come on, let's really worship. Let's get this thing going. Let's defeat everything by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. It's an amazing 21st century thing that we can come from our church building here in Albuquerque, New Mexico to wherever it is that you're at. Whether you're a part of our church and you're watching us at home or whether you're halfway around the world in Germany or Egypt or someplace like that, it's a miracle that we can come into where you're at. But my prayer today isn't just that we come to be with you where you're at. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit come to be with you where you're at. That he just fill your room. That he fill your heart. That he fill your mind. That he fills your imagination with the things of heaven that can be brought to the earth right now just by faith. Let him touch you this morning. Let him be with you this morning. Let him fill you all over again this morning. Shuda Bakasa. <laughs> yeah. It's the touch of his hand. Sweet portion given. That fresh anointing. It's the power of heaven. There's nothing else like him. No joy in the land. He spoils you for anything. Save the touch of his hand. It's the touch of his hand. A sweet portion given That fresh anointing It's the power of heaven No, there's nothing else like him No joy in the land He spoils you for it touch of his hand that song was written by a friend of mine and when she taught it to me she was about 80 81 years old skippy briggs and either she's about 120 by now or she's up in heaven one or the other oh but even in her 80s, her best days were right there in front of her. 
Her best days of loving God were right there in front of her. I'm saying your best days are right in front of you. I don't care how old you are. His mercies are new every morning. And since, it, since it's his morning here in Albuquerque, let his mercies be brand new to you. Let him touch you. It's the touch of his hand. A sweet portion given. That fresh anointing. It's the power of heaven. There's nothing else like him. No joy in the land. He spoils you for anything. Save the touch of his hand. No, there's nothing else like him. No joy in the land. He spoils you for anything. Save the touch of his hand. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, why are you praising God this morning anyway? What do you got to praise God about? What in the world do you have to praise God about? Well, I'll tell you what. I've got something to praise God about. Today is Claudia and my 40th wedding anniversary. 40 years putting up with me. Ha! You don't believe in miracles? Well, you better start. Hallelujah. That's just one reason I've got to praise God. I'm praising God because he's taking care of us through this. He's keeping us healthy. He's keeping us afloat. He's keeping everything going on. I mean, I've got, I've got a lot of reasons to pray. I've got, I've got 10,000 reasons to praise God this morning. Oh, just think of a few.
of his hand a sweet portion given that fresh anointing it's the power of heaven there's nothing else like him no joy in the land Spoils you for anything Save the touch of his hand yeah. There's nothing that breaks my heart more, children, than to have you approach me and ask me for something I've already put in your hands. There's nothing that slows down the process of heaven or the progress of heavenly things more than when you don't receive the fullness of what Jesus paid for on the cross. I'm not chastising you. I'm just telling you from my Father's heart, there are things, there are provisions there are gifts from heaven that have become yours through the blood of Jesus. And so you make up rules and you make up regulations about how you can achieve them, how you could be good enough. Your goodness has already been provided for. Your position cannot be lost because Jesus paid for it. So I'm telling you today that there's a holy boldness that the Spirit of God is going to send over the body of Christ. And they'll begin to speak these truths. And as they do, a great line will be drawn between those who are not believing and those who are. And you will see the mighty works of the kingdom through those that believe. And there will be a holy jealousy that will come forth and will convince those that they can too be believers this is the answer to so much, children. 
this is the answer to so much. And, and when I was sitting here, I felt that this room got filled with angelic hosts, and they, <laughs> they'd like to be busy. <laughs> so as soon as we move, they'll go forth and accomplish the part that belongs to them for the kingdom. But so many of them um, have nothing to do. I mean, they can praise and worship God most certainly, but they're here to help. So why don't we let them? Yes. Remember what God said, you don't have to beg him. It's already been given and you could walk in the fullness of new life. Amen. Amen. Oh, sorry. I'm always very excited for God to speak to us. And I love that he's really telling us to be bold and to, to step out and all the angelic things. Because sometimes for us here in this building, it's a little sad because I know you're online, but I don't get to see your faces. But I'm so glad that the angels are here taking your place right now so that we have plenty of people here. And today we're going to be talking about warfare. And a lot of times when we talk about warfare, our weapons of warfare, we're talking about people yelling at the devil or people uh, uh, doing their tongues real loud at the devil. But I'm telling you that God wants to explain to us the warfare that we're in. If you don't understand the war you're in, it's very hard to be in the battle. But God's already won the battle. God's already defeated Satan. Satan has already been no issue and no problem. And so we're going to look in the word of God and find how we can get ourselves, our mind, our heart, we can get ourselves in tune with the things of God. So on the screen or uh, your notes, I want you to see this. It says, our weapons that cannot be conquered is knowing who we are in Christ, who he is for us. So we are in the world, but knowing who we are in Christ and not entertaining for a moment any thoughts that are different. It's the power of the Holy Spirit who enables us to be Christ here on this earth and to have victory over every work of the evil one. And so what our main weapon is, is absolutely knowing who we are in Christ, who he has created us to be, that we know who we are, we know what God has said. And when we know who we are and we know what God has said, I'm telling you, whatever comes against us, it's not coming against us. It's coming against what we already know. There's so many people like, remember when they came and they said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we've not even heard there's a Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, there's many people that haven't heard who they are in Jesus and they get beaten up all the time, condemned by religion, condemned by other people, condemned by their own minds. But God wants us to see who he has created us to be and have that be a major weapon. We talk about warfare. It's not the screaming and yelling of the devil. This is what God says it is. In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, it says, For though we walk and live in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh, using mere human weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments, theories, reasoning, every proud and lofty thing that sets itself against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One, being in readiness to punish every insubordinate for his disobedience when your own submission and obedience as a church are fully secured and complete. Look at this obvious fact. It's before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him reflect and remind himself that even as he is Christ, so too are we. For though we boast rather freely about our power and authority, which the Lord gave you, gave for your upbuilding, is not for demolishing you. Yet I shall not be put to shame for, excuse, for exceeding the truth. And so here's what Paul is saying. He said, a lot of you think, well, Paul doesn't have it together. This person doesn't have it together. And he said, listen, I want you to understand what your warfare is. 
Your warfare is every thought, everything that would come against the knowledge of Jesus Christ that you would meditate on. But God has given us something to overcome those thoughts. God has given us of his blood. He's given us his life. He's given us his word. And it says that uh, the weapons that God gives us are mighty for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. The word stronghold means a belief that is strongly there. So you may have this strong belief that there's going to be horrible things that are going to happen to me if I do something wrong. You may have that belief. And so you've opened yourself up. You do something wrong and you think, oh, that's why I broke my back. Have you ever heard people talk like that? They say, God broke my back. Really? God broke your back? Yeah, he broke my back because the other day he told me to get up and pray and I didn't. And so they have a wrong belief about God and it becomes a stronghold in their heart and in their mind. But we've been given weapons. The weapons that we've been given is knowing who we are in Christ, his very word. Jesus had to use those weapons many times. You think about this, like Peter. Peter had a belief in his heart. And I don't know if it came from his upbringing. I don't know if it came from, uh, I don't know where it came from. But here's what he believed. That if I do something wrong enough, I'm rejected. He believed that. And so when he denied Jesus, which was incredibly wrong, in fact, it was the exact opposite of what he said he'd do. I'm going to go die for you. And then he denies Jesus. So he has this belief in his heart that if he does something extremely wrong, he's going to be rejected. And so what did he do? He reacted as though he was rejected. He got the disciples together and said, hey, let's start the fishing company again. Because he didn't think he was worthy to be a minister. He didn't think he was worthy because he had done something wrong. So he condemned himself. Jesus came and said, come on, Peter. Do you love me more than these fish that you've caught? And Peter said, come on, you know that I love you, Lord. Do you love me, Peter, more than anything? Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And Jesus called him back into ministry. Jesus didn't reject him. He rejected himself. But there was a warfare that was going on in his mind that said, I do bad, I'm condemned. But God, now remember, Jesus had already told the disciples that they would sit on the throne. Jesus had already told the disciples of the great work that they would have, that they would do the works that he did in greater. Jesus' word was already out there. But Peter's belief system was causing the word of God not to be active in his life. And Jesus had to remind him of that. I know that never happens to us where we have to be reminded of who we are or anything. So now, let me give you this scripture in the Message Bible. I'll also give it in the Passion. 2 Corinthians 10.3. The world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massive corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought, and emotion and impulse into the structure of a life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience for maturity. You stare and stare at the obvious, but you can't see the forest for the trees. If you're looking for a, a clear example of someone on Christ's side, why do you so quickly cut me out? Believe me, I'm not, I am quite sure of my standing with Christ. Yet you may think I overstate the authority he gave me, but I'm not backing off. Every bit of my commitment is for the purpose of building you up. After all, not for tearing you down. And so we see something here is that Paul has been come against. Oh, he's not godly. He's not this. And Paul says, you know what? I know what God has said about me. And I know that when you have these condemning things coming against you, that every thought can be led away captive. And he said, you can tear down the philosophies that come against you. You can tear down all the things that stand against the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because I've given you the weapons to do so. And the weapons to do so are remembering and bringing to the forefront of your mind what God has already said. And so I want to bring this one to you in the Passion Bible, 1 Corinthians 10, 3, just to make sure we got it. Not just one translation, not two, but three. And it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 3, for although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aim. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We, cannot, we can demolish 
every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow down in obedience to the anointed one. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as you choose, as you, as you choose complete obedience. You seem always to be looking at people by their outward appearance. If someone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should remind himself of this, that we belong to Christ no less than he does. I'm not ashamed even if I've come across as one who has overstated the authority given to us by the Lord for its authority to help build you up and not tear you down. So let's say, according to Paul, you have a thought that stands against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You have a thought that says, I'm no good. I'll never make it. And he says, God has given you the weapons to where you can lead that disobedient thought. You can lead that thought and make it obey what God has said. I was thinking about uh, Marcus. You were telling me, Mary was telling me that on Facebook he has where he's getting prayer requests. And uh, Marcus Guterres, who's been here. And when people uh, come to him for prayer, he says, give me the testimony of it. And he keeps putting on Facebook, this person healed of this and I can prove it. And so what did he do? He took the lying thoughts of sickness and disease and pain and discomfort, and he spoke the truth of Jesus Christ, the healing truth, and he's asking the people that he's prayed for, did you actually get a healing? They're saying yes, and he says, then I can prove it. I can prove that this worked. He let every thought that was in disobedience captive to the knowledge of the great healing that God has already done. And so Jesus, when he walked this earth, he was not without trials and tribulations, just like we are. He had trials and tribulation, but he used his weapon of the word of God. Satan came to him and said, if you are the son of God. And how many times Jesus over and over and again proclaimed, I am the son of God. He stood before Pilate, if you are a king, I am a king, but a king of men's hearts. And so Jesus always used what God had told him and called him to be as his absolute weapon of warfare to defeat anything that would come against him. So in Colossians 2.18, look at this very clearly. It says, don't let anyone disqualify you from the prize, except pastors. They can disqualify people from the prize and tell them that they don't know. Don't let anyone disqualify you from the prize. Don't let their pretended sincerity fool you into their deliberate leading you into intimidation of angel worship. For they take pleasure in pretending to be experts on something they know nothing about. Their reason is meaningless and comes only from their own opinions. And so sometimes when you're worshiping God or, or you're a certain way, people will come to you and they'll say, you know, I mean, that's good. But God has moved on beyond worship. God has moved on beyond the Bible. God has moved on beyond the prophetic. We actually had some ministers come that said the day of the prophetic is over. And uh, poor Mary, she's out of a job immediately. You know, how did we know the day of the prophetic was over till they announced it? And they said, it's the day of the teacher because they were teachers. And uh, they <laughs> proclaimed that. They disqualified anybody that did anything but what they were doing. And it's, it's hard to not do this. People that are worshipers, worship leaders, they think everybody should be that. Yeah. But they shouldn't. And I teach and I study the word of God. And I'm telling you, it intrigues me all the time. And I think everybody should do that. But maybe your relationship with God has to do with one on just being with him. Maybe your relationship with God comes differently than my relationship. And I have no right to disqualify you. And you have no right to disqualify me. Don't let anyone disqualify you from the things of God. Or you think, wow, he'll do it for them because they do this, this, and this. No, God wants to do it for his entire family. And so he tells us, because there's a lot of judgments that will come against you, a lot of judgments. I got a letter not too long ago from uh, these friends of mine that uh, have gone to a different church, and they said, you know, Glory Bound was always the weird ones to us. But now our church is trying to move in the things that you guys have been moving in for years. So I guess weird is better. But that was great for them to say, but for years they went after us, for years until some light came. And I'm not saying we're the only ones that have the light, but I know we do have the light. Isaiah 54 and verse 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall show to be in the wrong. 
This peace, righteousness, security, triumph over opposition is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Those in whom the ideal servant of the Lord is reproduced. This is the righteousness or vindication which they have from me. This is that which I impart to them for their justification, says the Lord. Several things here. He says, in whom the ideal servant of the Lord is reproduced. You realize that you are the reproduction of Jesus. According to the word of God, he was the seed. And the seed, if it had not died and was buried, it would have remained alone. But that seed died and was buried, and when it did, it produced seed, 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 seed. It produced Jesus everywhere. And he said, you're who the ideal servant of the Lord is reproduced. And the tongues that rise against you, you will show to be in the wrong, because I've made you righteous. I've given you that as a gift, and you are right before me. And if we're right before God, who cares what anybody thinks of us? And it says any tongue that rises against you will not prosper. And so God gives us this. So weapons come against us, but God has given us the weapon of righteousness. God has given us the weapon of right standing. God has given us the weapon, the ability to show them to be in the wrong by the way our lives are. Isaiah 54, 17 in the Message Bible. No weapon that can hurt you has ever been forged. Any accuser who takes you to court will be dismissed as a liar. This is what God's servants can expect. I'll see to it that everything works out for the best. God's decree. Oh, what a wonderful thing. The any tongue, they're going to be shown to be liars. And God says, here's my promise to you. Not only do I work all things together for good because you love me and are called according to my purpose, but I, the God of the angel armies, will make sure that everything turns out for the best. Whatever situation you're in right now, it's going to turn out for the best. We're in a situation right now that all of us wish we could get out of. Come on. But it's going to turn out for the best because God promises this. Isaiah 54, 17 in the Passion Bible. But I promise you, this is God, no weapon meant to hurt you will succeed. And you will refute every accusing word spoken against you. But the promise is the inheritance of Yahweh's servants to their vindication is from me, says Yahweh. You are vindicated before God. Does it matter if in your own head you're not vindicated? Does it matter in the religious minds that you're not vindicated? It doesn't matter who doesn't see you the way God does. How God sees you is how you must see you. You cannot see yourself differently than God does or it doesn't work. You have to, and I have to see ourselves as righteous, as children of the Most High, as empowered by God himself. We have to see this. This righteousness is a weapon. Every time different weapons are listed in the Bible, spiritual weapons, righteousness is a part of it. Yes. It's very important that you have been made right before God. You made a confession with your mouth that Jesus died and resurrected and you were saved. And in the heart, you believed unto righteousness. When you got born again, you got born again unto righteousness. You are righteous. That means you've been made right before God. Well, I don't act that way. Well, how dumb of you. You should act the way you really are. And we are righteous. In 2 Corinthians 6, 7, it says, For we commend ourselves to you by our truthful teaching by the power of God working through us, and with the mighty weapons of righteousness, a sword in one hand, a shield in the other. So when people call you unworthy or you feel unworthy, get your weapon. The weapons are mighty for the overthrow and destruction. Every thought that arises in your mind against the knowledge of Jesus. A thought comes in, I'm horrible, I'm this, I'm that, I'm exactly the way everybody thought I'd turn out. No, that's a thought that's risen in your mind. I am righteous, holy, right before God. That brings that thought into obedience. And so in 1 Peter, and this is very important that you listen to these scriptures. Very important that we receive them. Every one of us, and probably everyone watching, have received prophetic words from God. God speaking, telling us our future, telling us what we're to do, telling us who we are, telling us how he sees us. It is important that you go over those prophecies again and again so you can see them come to pass. It actually is a weapon. So look at this. In 1 Peter 1.18. So Timothy, my son, I'm entrusting you with the responsibility in keeping with the very first prophecies that were spoken over your life and are now in the process of fulfillment 
in this great work of ministry in keeping with the prophecies spoken over you. With this encouragement, use your prophecies as a weapon as you wage spiritual warfare by faith and with a clean conscience. For there are many who reject these virtues and are now destitute of true faith. And so Paul tells him, he says, I'm going to tell you how to use faith. There were prophecies spoken over you. Then act like they were true and act upon them. I started getting prophecies at a very young age that I would be a teacher of teachers. I started getting the, the prophecies that I was to impact people with teaching, that God had given a gift there. There were many times where I did not feel worthy of any gift. There were many times where I thought, this isn't going to work. But I did something. I gave myself over to the prophetic that God had said. I began to study. I began to take several hours a day in my college days, several hours a day with the Bible, and studying and spending time with the Lord. Why? Because he had prophesied over me. And when my thoughts started coming, I'm no longer called as a teacher. I've really blown it. Those prophecies kept coming back to me. And I was able to wage a warfare. No, I am called to do this. No, I am called. And I'm telling you, whatever you're called to do, you're going to be fought in that. I've never once been fought in my singing ministry. Never once. Because I don't have one. I've never been fought in that. But I've been fought in the teaching. Whatever you're called to, that's where the warfare is. That's where the fight is. And you have a weapon. The prophetic word, what God spoke, that's your weapon. And you could say, this is what God said. I mean, yell at yourself and make those thoughts come into obedience to what Jesus has done. And so we find a woman that in the Bible that was caught in adultery. And everyone decided she's disqualified. In fact, the only thing she qualifies for is death. Let's kill her. We're going to stone her to death. In fact, let's get Jesus involved so he can stone her too. But the woman that was caught in adultery... Jesus told the men that were there, he said, you who has no sin, cast the first stone. They left. He's standing alone with her. And he said, who is there to condemn you? Nobody. And he says, neither then do I condemn you. Go and you can't, you don't have to sin anymore. And so we saw something happen. Lots of condemnation. Even the woman herself, she knew she deserved it. But there was Jesus totally full of mercy and grace and loving kindness who has forgiven and wiped away our sin. And we stand before him pure and holy, as pure and holy as Jesus is. And so we think, okay, right now we're under grace. But when we get to heaven, we're going to have to answer for every dot, every tittle, everything that we didn't do. There's going to be the film of us showing all the things that we did and all the things that we thought. How is it that we have a God of grace and mercy Loving kindness on earth, but when we get to heaven, boy, we're going to get it. Makes it really look forward to getting to heaven, right? But it's not the truth. Here's what the Bible says. It says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, In the union and communion we have with him, love is brought to completion, obtains perfection with us, that we have the confidence for the day of judgment, with assurance and boldness to face him, because as he is so too are we in this world. There's no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors, expels every trace of terror, for fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached full, full maturity of love, has not yet grown into love's complete perfection. He says, listen, you not only are set free here, on the day of judgment, you're going to be judged just like Jesus is. Was Jesus punished? He was for our sins. But on judgment? No. And you've been judged already by the word I've given you, God says. And he says that on that day, I'm going to reveal the secrets of your heart. He's going to reveal how much you wanted to do for him, even if you didn't get around to it. God goes by the heart. See, we look at people, we say, you know, God goes by the heart. You had lust in your heart. Well, what if I have holy, righteous things in my heart? God goes by the heart. I might want to tell somebody so much about Jesus that I might just get afraid at the time, but it was in my heart. Let God go by our heart. And our standing with God is the same as Jesus. Now look at it in the Message Bible, 1 John 4, 17. This is the way God ha love has run of the house. Becomes a home and mature in us so that we are free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. Yay. 
There's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear since fear is crippling. A fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is one not yet fully formed in love. See, God doesn't want us to be afraid on this earth, afraid of what happens on judgment day. What happens here? I'm going to get in trouble for this. I'm going to get in trouble for that. Listen, if we just relax and let God love us and understand my standing is identical to the standing that Jesus had when he walked the earth. Identical. My position with God. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 17. He said, Father, you have loved them. That's us. Even as you have loved me. God loves us the same way he loves Jesus with all that passion. He doesn't have his favorite son. He's the firstborn, but we're born right into this and God loves us. And we should be very confident in that. That should help us to lead every thought captive. That should help our warfare. I'm not worrying against God. I'm not worrying against behavior. I'm worrying against the thoughts that come in my mind that try to condemn me, that try to put me down in any way, that try to keep me from moving forward in the absolute anointing and power that God has given me. And so God tells us that we're more than conquerors. Okay, so we look at that, Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, because we're going to understand, I, before we go to that, I want to say this, that in the natural, if you do something wrong to somebody, they're going to withdraw themselves from you. They're going to withdraw. I, I'm not going to love them anymore. That's not how God is. Never. Now let's look at it. Romans 8, 37. Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all, for God has made us to be more than conquerors, and he has demonstrated, his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. So now I live with the confidence that there's nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, over troubles, fallen angels, dark rulers of the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There's no more power above or beneath us, no power that can ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one. If we could get confident, in how much God loves us, then it doesn't matter what happens. We know God is working everything for the best for us. It doesn't matter what's going on. Nothing can separate us. If you know somebody loves you, it's easy to go to them and ask them for anything. If you know somebody loves you, it's easy to go and say, hey, I blew that. I'm sorry. And no, you'll be forgiven. But God's passionate love does not diminish one bit by behavior, your opinion, man's opinion, God's passionate love is always there for us. So whatever he asks for, it's there for us. And God says prophetically, God says in his word, I am raising my body up. The church is the answer to what's going on in the world. We are not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to us. That means we're in the center and everything evolves around what God is doing with us. Doesn't look that way. It looks like the church is weak and beggarly and they always tell us what to do and we're just no good. No, that's not what God said. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, the purpose of this was to, the, to unveil before every throne and rank angelic order in the heavenly realm, God's full and diverse wisdom revealed through the church. It's perfectly wise plan designed from eternal ages and fulfilled completely in our Lord Jesus Christ so that now we have boldness through him and free access as kings before the Father because of our complete confidence in Christ's faithfulness. What is God doing? He said, it's through my body that I'm revealing to the angelic. It's to my body that I'll reveal to the world who my kings are. It's to, through my body that I will reveal what my plan is through us. Yet we see ourselves as weak and beggarly. That's the warfare. We have to see ourselves as the powerhouses that God has made us to be, as identical to Jesus, just as he is, so too are we in this world. And so we know that when Jesus came, he came to destroy the works of the evil one. And either he accomplished what he came to do, or we still have to do it. No, we don't have to do it. It's already been accomplished. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, God armed God disarmed the principalities and powers that were raged against us. 
He made a bold display, public example of them, triumphing over them in him and in it, the cross. And so when Jesus was on the cross, according to the word of God, he disarmed the principalities. Not that we're raging against him only, but they were raging against us. So they've been disarmed and we've been fully armed with Christ. He tells us in Colossians 2.15 in the Passion Bible, he says, and this is important that you see it this way because the weapons that come against us, the devil that comes against us is simply to accuse us and simply to make us feel terrible. In Colossians 2.15, it says, then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. Amazing. Jesus dies on the cross, becoming our sin. We are there with him. And Satan thinks he's my prisoner. But when Jesus was there, he burst through the walls and he took Satan as prisoner and brought him before all of the heavenlies, tied up, stripped of all sham authority. And according to the word of God, the authority that he had was to accuse us. And guess what? I'm above accusation. No devil can accuse me. No man, because I am in Christ Jesus. I walk in the fullness of who he is. In Romans 8 and verse 1, it says, So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. For the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life is inside us. There's no condemnation anymore. Now listen and be honest with me here. What would your life be like if you had no condemnation? What would your life be like if there wasn't one condemning thought? What would your life be like if you didn't think one thought different about yourself than God thought? That's what God wants. He wants us to win this warfare that's already been won. And how do we do it? By our weapons, by our prophetic words that have come to us, by what God has said, by what the word of God says, believing what God believes about us, not what man believes about us, not what we believe about, believe what God believes about us, and it becomes what we believe. And that's how this warfare is done. He says this, he says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, but thanks be to God. <laughs> thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory. And through us spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. Now I want you to notice something. It says we're always led in triumph. We're always led in victory. And it has something before then. He wasn't just, thank you, God, we're always led in triumph. He says, thanks to God, <laughs> always leads us in triumph. You're in a bad situation right now. All of us might be just in different ways. Let's start thanking God. Father, I thank you that you are the all wise. I thank you, Father, that you always have our best interest. I thank you, Father that nothing can come against us. And we began to thank God, and that leads us in triumph. That leads us in victory, according to the word of God. Now I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is God's opinion. I think his opinion matters more than ours. What do you think? Yeah. Now, we look inside, and what we see is that anyone, that includes us, united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone. The new life beckons. Look at it. And this all comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationship with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sin. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences, to enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. 
This is incredible. I'm a new creation, brand new. I'm not the old remodeled. I'm brand new, a brand new creation. And I've got to understand that God said, I've settled the account. You're right with me. Yeah, what if I do something wrong? I didn't do something right to get myself right with God. Jesus, the Messiah, did. And I will stop doing wrong things if I'll get a hold of the weapon of righteousness that I've been made righteous in God, that I've been made brand new. And my relationship with God is perfectly right. And he says, then you have a job. Go tell the world that they're square with God, that he's not holding against any man their trespasses. But we thought our job was to show them where their sin is. We thought that was our job. Tell them where they're wrong. Tell them how much God is disappointed in them. But God approaches it a different way. I've taken care of all sin so that you can have favor with me. It says in the Passion Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, don't you like that? Enfolded in him. Enfolded into Christ, he's become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation, uh, reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping record of their transgressions. And he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the doors of reconciliation to God. We're ambassadors of the anointed one who carried the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Amen. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. So we're supposed to be doing something, not condemning the world, but showing the world you're reconciled to God. Here's the door. Come on in. God loves you. And you have absolute favor with him. And you can be enfolded in Christ. Not one transgression is held against you. Now I want to tell you something about the blood of Jesus. It not only cleansed you from sin, it continuously, continuously cleanses you from all sin and unrighteousness. So maybe you blew it this morning. It's okay. His blood has covered it and taken care of it. He's holding no transgressions against you. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 25 now that you've arrived at your destination by faith in Christ, you're in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. In Christ's family, there can be no divisions into Jew, non-Jew, slave, free, male, female. Among us, you are all equal. That is... We are all in common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you're in Christ's family, then you're Abraham's famous descendant, heirs, according to the covenant promise. Paul is telling us, God is telling us, you all have a right to me. You all have access to me. You all have a relationship directly with me. Don't need to go through any man to have a relationship with God. We can all have this, and we all are on equal footing because of what Christ Jesus has had. And so I want you to go down to 2 Corinthians 121. But it is God who confirms and makes us steadfast. Is it you who confirms and makes it? No, it's, let me do it again. It is God who confirms and makes us steadfast and establishes us in joint fellowship with you in Christ and has consecrated and anointed us, endued us with gifts of the Holy Spirit. He has appropriated and acknowledged us by, as his by putting his seal upon us giving us the Holy Spirit in his heart as a security deposit, a guarantee of the fulfillment of his promise. God said, I've begun this work. I'm the one who takes care of it. I'm the one who has joint fellowship with you. And I need to tell you that you have been given the Holy Spirit. It's God's seal. You know, the word of God says, God looks at your heart and expects them to be absolutely right. Why? Because he's made them that way. I've been recreated in Christ. I have the very life of the Spirit of God. In the Passion Bible, 2 Corinthians 121, now it is God himself who has anointed us. He is constantly strengthening both you and us in union with Christ. He knows we are his since he has stamped his seal of love over our hearts, given us the Holy Spirit like an engagement ring is given to a bride, a down payment, a blessing to come. 
We've been given the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. God says, I recognize you as my own. We are recognized as God's very own. I am his. I am my beloved's and he is mine. I will be their God and they will be my people. What is our warfare? Believing what God has said. He's not going to leave us because he's mad because we did something or didn't do something. I will never, no, never, no, never, no, never, no, never leave or forsake you. 2 Corinthians, let's go down there. 2 Corinthians 2, 4. And my language, my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, plausible words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, approved by the Spirit and the power of God operating on, in me, on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions and thus persuading them. What you have to know is God has called all of us to have demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. It's not just been given to the few, it's been given to all of us. But we have to fight the warfare and believe that when God says, I have given you power and authority, that it's true. We have to believe that God says, I've given you the gifts of the Spirit, and it's true. That's the warfare that we rage. Because the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what are you thinking in your heart? If there's something you're thinking that's not from God, don't do it. Replace those thoughts. Fight the warfare. We've won the battle. God bless you. Mary, come on up. Okay. Um, I just have a few words to release for people out there, or I don't know, just... This has been an opportunity for me in a way because I'm practicing some things. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to practice. I appreciate it. Um, one, of, one of the words that I, I received is for um, someone named Eloy or Lloyd. Um, the instruction from the Lord is to put your hand right now on your stomach. Um, there's some areas of your stomach that are a little bit twisted and it's been a chronic problem, and the Lord wants to untwist some of those areas for you, and you would not have pain, and you would have a new freedom in your life because you will not have to worry about this anymore in Jesus' name. So I speak that. And to someone named Brian, God wants to tell you how proud he is of you today, that you've come through a very, very hard time that would sink most people but you have kept your confidence and your faith intact, even in front of your family who, uh, who has really come against you in so much as they don't understand why you, why you still are maintaining your faith. But God said he's with you because you're feeling a little bit lonely and he wants you to know how proud he is of you and how this loneliness will be displaced by your closer union with God who will not leave you or forsake you. And you're going to have reasons to smile and be happy again. So send that word to you and, and bless you with that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And, and the other word that I got is for someone we know, and it's for Art Hirsch. Art, when it came to church this morning while Claudia was speaking, you Um, Art, I felt like the Lord said that he's going to send you a dream or give you a vision, and it's going to show you the places that you're going to go to in the future, and the future is not that far off. I felt like, um, I, and I know this because when you were coming to church, you had been sick for a little while, and I want to tell you that that was something that came upon you to try and stop you 
um, from having the vision to go to all the nations. So Art, guess what? Don't be discouraged. Don't feel like, oh, am I ever going to get to go again? God wants to refresh you today and remind you that, yes, son, you have places to go and people to meet. And God is not done with the good things he has in mind for you to do. So I just speak that anything that came against you when you traveled, um, we rebuke that and cancel that in Jesus' name. Any words that were spoken, canceled in Jesus' name. We speak a refreshment to you and new strength and encouragement in, in Jesus' name. And, and uh, the last word that I have is for somebody who um, I... I I want to say that their name is begins with a C, but this is a person who has been sick for a while, and they thought you had the coronavirus, but you don't. don't. They found out you didn't. They thought you had the flu. The Lord said to tell you what you have is not viral. It's bacterial. And right now, in the name of Jesus, God is healing you from that bacteria, from that infection that they have not been able to identify. And it's been after you for a while, but today begins the new day of total wholeness and healing in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, that's all I got. Do we have any other announcements? I just want to say one thing. All right. You know, on Friday night, there were some words given, and uh, there were some healings that were claimed, and they got healed right then while listening to the broadcast. And also, uh, Dan brought up a good point. He said there was a prophecy given for Dennis that I knew was for me too. When you hear prophecies, and they might be for someone else, claim them for yourself. And I want to tell you how you can do that. Every promise that you read in the Word of God was written for someone else. But we get the scriptures because they're alive. So prophecies, same thing. Claim things for yourself. And I do want to say this. We talked about every thought that arises against the knowledge of Jesus. I want, if you have tormenting thoughts or things that are bothering you, I want you right now to bring those thoughts to the Amen. forefront and demolish them by the thoughts of Jesus. Amen. Make sure you do that. And the announcements are we'll be here again, and there's going to be prayer, and it's up on your screens. Uh, Tuesday night intercessory prayer that Mary's going to head up, and she can make that announcement in just a moment. I want you to be here Friday night at 7 and Sunday at 9.30, and Mary's going to talk to you about Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Um, you can see the sign, and uh, it's a conference call style prayer. You dial that number, 712-775-7031. And when you're prompted, you give the, um, the code and make sure you put the hashtag at the end of it. Otherwise, it won't work. And we pray from 7 to 8 o'clock every Tuesday evening. Please bring your prayer requests. Um, if you need healing, please come on. And there's power in unity. Love to have you there. Maybe you can't stay um, with us for the whole hour. Don't let that stop you. If you can come on for five minutes and be in unity with us, we'll be very grateful to have you with us. There's so much we need to be in agreement for. I um, especially want to encourage the people who live in New Mexico. Um, our mayor, the mayor of Albuquerque, has said that he does not have enough money to take care of some of the things in the city and that maybe... Um, city workers might not receive their whole paycheck. So we want to begin to speak relief for this in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, we, I've heard a few amazing things about how we are ahead of other states in how we're processing some of the um, information about the coronavirus and how people are being tested. So. We're doing some things that are very breakthrough-oriented, so I'm grateful to God for that. And I believe that New Mexico has a big stake in this because of the laboratories that are here. Um, our, one of our brothers um, who used to teach here sometimes told us that we have more PhDs in New Mexico than any place in the world. So we have a potential for some real scientific breakthroughs and some major things. And so um, you may not like to hear that, but it's true anyway about the scientists. And so pray that righteous men and women of God who are scientists would rise up with the answers that the whole country needs in Jesus' name. Okay? Okay. All right. Want to tell you goodbye. Love you. Let's see you soon. Okay. Amen. Amen.
trouble. He says, trust in me.